Okay, so um, <clears throat> thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to tell you uh, uh, an unpublished story about uh, mapping DNA replication in C. elegans. Um, <clears throat> so my lab is generally interested in chromatin and, and one of the projects is to try and understand how chrom chromosomes are replicated. And I, obviously, Anya gave a great introduction to this process, but I just wanted to highlight uh, um, some interesting facts about this. And, and one of the, the things that particularly interested us was obviously this is uh, two replication forks moving away from each other. But this, in this electron micrograph, you can see there's little blo blobs. Obviously, these are beads on a string, and they're, of course, nucleosomes. You see, obviously, they're ahead of the replication fork, but you see directly behind the replication fork, you can see nucleosomes. So we know that nucleosomes are assembled very rapidly rapidly during DNA replication. And a number of years ago, we wanted to uh, see if we could investigate this process um, and a highly simplified view of chromatin disassembly and reassembly behind the replication fork. It occurred to us that uh, the synthesis of, of, of Okazaki fragments, because it's far more convoluted than the synthesis of, of, of the leading, leading strand, is potentially impacted by chromatin or nucleosome assembly. And one way of which we can uh, uh, potentially assay this was to preserve uh, the Okazaki fragments within the genome by inhibiting uh, the final step, and that's the DNA ligation reaction. So if we inhibit DNA ligase, we can potentially purify a genome which is full of NICs, and then purify the fragments from that, and then analyze what the fragments look like. And um, uh, so we did this initially in budding yeast. And what we actually find is, so DNA ligase 1 is an essential gene. It's encoded by the CDC9 uh, gene. And uh, so we placed CDC9 under the control of a doxycycline repressible promoter. Uh, we grew the cells. We shut off expression of ligase. And then uh, uh, purified the genomic DNA, and then labeled the NICs, and then run the products on a denaturing agarose gel. And you can see that we accumulate small DNA molecules over the time course. But within the smear, there seemed to be somewhat of a periodicity. And the, this, this periodicity actually lines up very well with, with nucleosomes and the chromatin repeat. And so we're able to demonstrate that there is potentially a relationship between how you synthesize the lagging strand and how you ultimately assemble nucleosomes on them. So our general model, which we believe explains part of our data, is that um, nucleosomes are assembled very rapidly behind the replication fork. And they're, they're assembled so rapidly that uh, the subsequent Okazaki fragment, which is being extended extended by Paul Delta. Uh, Paul Delta then invades through NIC translation with the help of FEN1 uh, towards the nucleosome. Now, in the, in the absence of DNA ligase 1, potentially that allows the, uh, uh, Paul Delta to advance towards or into the nucleosome, and him increasing histone DNA contacts at the nucleosome then cause it to stop. And this process, you can imagine, is repeated over and over again throughout the genome. Uh, and this is potentially why we see uh, uh, the, uh, the fragments have a, a periodicity which is reminiscent of the nucleosome repeat. Okay, so I'm not going to talk any more really about that today. What I wanted to talk about was, was our efforts to, to map high resolution uh, DNA replication at high resolution in, in, in metazoan genomes. Um, so, uh, because we can purify these fragments, we can actually obviously sequence them. And if you sequence them in a strand-specific manner, um, what you can actually do is, is find where replication origins are. And the basic principle of this is that when forks, uh, uh, when replication initiates at an origin, you have two forks moving away from each other. Forks moving to the right should have fragments which map to the correct strand, and vice versa, uh, forks moving towards the left. So every replication origin should have a distinct signature of a transition from Watson to Crick strand reads. Now, um, of course, in working in budding yeast, we know essentially where all the replications are, uh, origins are uh, initially. And if we map our, our, our sequencing data relative to known origins, we can see this very strong transition from Watson to Crick, uh, Crick strand reads at the origins. We can, of course, look at uh, a whole chromosome. This is chromosome 10, and you can see that there are many regions of transition from Watson strand reads. So this is increasing Watson strand reads at the top and increasing Crick strand reads at the bottom. And many of these transitions are replication origins, are the transitions are sites of, of, of termination. So um, just to help you uh, understand this data, I've just broken it down into some simple principles. So imagine that we have uh, a very simple uh, organism with a tiny chromosome. There's two replication origins. Now, if these two replication origins fire at the same time, then the forks move toward, away from each other and, and basically converge in the middle here. Now, if we have a population of three cells and they all behave in the same way, we purify the fragments from these, and then by sequencing them, we're, we're essentially just counting them up. 
We can then develop a simple algorithm which measures a transition from, from Watson strand reads to Crookes strand reads, so a positive signal would be a replication origin, and a negative signal here would be a region of termination between the two replication origins. <coughs> Uh, you can imagine a different scenario here where um, cell one behaves the same as what I've showed you earlier, but uh, in cell two and three, origin one doesn't actually fire, and origin uh, fork initiated from origin two actually moves all the way through and passively replicates this region. Now, the net effect of this is, is what's shown down at the bottom here, so the, what's known as the origin efficiency, so the likelihood that the origin is used in this population of cells is much lower, and you can see that's borne out down here, and it also has an obviously managed manifest effect on the side of the termination here, whereas this origin here is unchanged. Okay, so what's nice about this assay, it allows you to map DNA replication in mixed population of cells, so we don't need to synchronize, but we can also deduce the, the behavior of subpopulations within the overall population. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'll skip that. So um, one of the things we wanted to do was move up from budding yeast and, and ask what are the determinants for replication origins in metazoan genomes. Um, and uh, I guess um, so. One of the things we actually know, and there's a little bit of controversy about what determines replication origins. But one general principle which seems to be uh, true is that replication origins are generally associated with the actively transcribed regions. Okay. Now, as I just mentioned, Okazaki fragments allows us to map DNA replication population of cells, so we can actually use this assay in potentially an organism. And the organism that we chose to do, do this was in C. elegans, and in particular, we're interested in embryogenesis, because one of the unique features of embryogenesis is uh, the embryo experiences profound changes in, in transcriptional states. So very early on, there's essentially no zygotic transcription, and then uh, a peak of the zygotic transcription kicks in around gastrulation, and then obviously changes through this embryogenesis. So we wanted to understand whether DNA replication program is actually changed through this process as well. Um, to cut a long story short, we're able to uh, inactivate DNA ligase in, the, in, in C. elegans. Obviously, we don't want to, if we hit it too hard and get rid of all the ligase, basically that kills the, kills the organism. So we, we, we basically titrate it uh, at minimal levels. So uh, in order to perform our assay, we, we feed the, uh, the C. elegans as L3 stage with RNAi containing bacteria. We allow them to grow up to adults, and then we, we harvest the adults which contain embryos in uterus. We can then purify the embryos from these adults here, which contain what are known as mixed early embryos, and then we can basically break them open, purify the genomic <coughs> DNA, and treat them essentially as we, we did with budding yeast. Um, so just a, a overview, we're harvesting embryos from... Uh, 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 from worms grown in liquid culture. These are what's known as mixed early embryos, so they're going to range from two to about 100 cells. But the important point here uh, I just want to illustrate is that most of the signal will be derived from the later stage embryos simply because they contain, obviously, the most nucleic acid. Okay, so... Um, uh, when, uh, this is basically what we find when we look for, for perform the same assay as we did with, with, with budding yeast. So basically what I'm showing you here is, again, a denaturing agarose gel, and we're simply titrating down the amount of DNA ligase in the embryos. And what you can see is we see this really beautiful, uh, what looks like a nucleosome ladder, and this is obviously very reminiscent of the nucleosome repeat. And you know, when I first thought, saw this, I thought it was nuclear <laughs> digestion, but it's, it's not, it's not apoptosis. This is, this is a, as I'll hope to convince you in a minute, uh, are, are the really the, the fragments. Um, and in comparison to what we see in budding yeast, this is the, the budding yeast fragments, and this is budding yeast uh, next to a classic MNA's digestion of chromatin. We can also obviously do the same in, in C. elegans. So these are our fragments here, and this is an MNA's digestion, and basically they line up very nicely as well. Okay, so the next question is, is can we actually use this to find DNA replication origins in, in the C. elegans genome? And the, the, uh, fortunately, the answer is yes. So this is a region of, of chromosome one, and basically it's a similar schematic to what I showed you earlier. So uh, fragments increasing on the Watson strand are on the top here, fragments increasing on the Crick strand are at the bottom here, and basically you can see regions of transition as well. Uh, we can find replication origins, and so that's shown at the top here. So these are these black bars up here, and then the height of the bar correlates is basically indicative of the efficiency of which the origin is used. Now, of course, this data is, is nowhere near as clean as what we see in budding yeast, but nevertheless, we can find uh, replication origins throughout the genome uh, pretty effectively. 
Okay, so the next uh, question is, is, so what specifies replication origins? So why are replication origins where they are in the genome? Um, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, there's been an extensive effort to characterize modifications throughout many eukaryotic <laughs> genomes, and this has been performed by the ENCODE and ModEncode products, projects. And what's become apparent is basically you can segment various regions of the genome according to different modification states. So promoters, enhancers, and regions of repressed chromatin all have uh, particular you know, characteristic chromatin signatures. Um, and this is evolutionary conserved. And so quite simply, we can, the, as a first approach, we can basically ask um, what are replication origins near which chromatin states. Uh, and that's basically shown here. And if you look here, this is where replication origins, so the, so the strongest correlation is, is next to enhancers and also promoters. And, and basically it's 50-50, it's either a promoter or enhancer. But if you actually look in the, the modern code data, it's a very fine line between what's a promoter and enhancer. And, and often cases, they are essentially uh, right next door to each other. So we wanted to delve into this uh, relationship a little bit more closely. Uh, and one way in which we can uh, do this or display the data is, is obviously via heat maps. So what I'm going to show you is a series of heat maps in relation to, to where, where replication origins. And um, as first, what we can do is, is take our origins, so this is origin efficiency, and just basically rank all origins from the most efficient to the least efficient down here. We can then take the same coordinates as I've showed you here and then rank various histone modifications relative to these uh, replication origins. And these modifications are associated with gene enhancers. And what you can see is there's a very nice uh, correlation between uh, the histone modification in position but also intensity in relation to the replication origin. We can also do the same for modifications which are more classically associated with gene transcription. This on H3K4 trimethylation. This also tracks, but the correlation is, is not quite as good as, as, as the K27 acetylation or dimethylation, as would be expected from this. Uh, H3K27 trimethylation is anti-correlated with replication origins across the genome. So this rather simple analysis basically say, uh, says if you're a replication origin, there's a very strong chance that you're also modified with H3K27 and dimethylation of H3K4. So obviously we wanted to ask the reverse question. If you're enriched for H3K27, what's the chance you're a replication origin? And we can quite simply do this by basically ranking H3K27 peaks and then asking uh, what's, the, what's the chance you're an origin? And we find basically there's, there's a very strong correlation. But potentially what does the data <laughs> most justice is actually just looking at the raw data. And obviously, this is, this is the, the Arkazaki fragments. Here's the origins up here. And then H3K27, trimethyl, dye, and monomethylation of H3K4. And you can see that many of the peaks, or essentially in often cases, all of the peaks uh, are, co are coincident with peaks of H3K27. But it's also not only coincidence, but the height of the peak also tends to correlate very extremely well. Okay, so we think the gene enhancers, uh, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, appear to be defining the, uh, the replication, where replication origins are within the genome. So the next question is, is, is what's the relation with transcription? So is transcription actually required to establish the replication origins? Um, so we know that, obviously, historically, we know that there's a clear evidence between uh, transcription and replication, as I mentioned in the introduction, but also there's some classic experiments performed in, in Xenopus um, and also in Drosophila as well. And, and, and ge the general principle is that a replication prior to zygotic genome activation within, within embryos appears to initiate uh, from many closely spaced sites. However, after zygotic genome activation, replication seems to be more constrained and potentially then uses specific replication origins. And this was beautifully demonstrated by Olivia Ariane and, and Marcel Michely in, in uh, the RDNA locus in, in Xenopus uh, 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 embryos. Okay, so um, C. elegans is actually a little bit different to Xenopus. Uh, it doesn't contain, it doesn't uh, go through the rapid synchronous cleavage cycles in your early embryogenesis. It, it establishes founder uh, lineages very early, and there are clear evidence of asymmetric cell division. So we wanted to see whether these general principles hold true. 
Fortunately, um, a recent uh, paper was published very recently, which, which essentially went through uh, and, and performed single uh, embryo sequencing of, of transcription for, from basically uh, um, single cell embryos right the way up through to hatching. And they took 50 time points through, this, through, this, uh, through embryogenesis. And what you can actually do is basically segment their data into transcripts which are clearly being expressed by the zygotic genome and transcripts which are, uh, which are maternally deposited. So these are transcripts which essentially decay through, through embryogenesis. And so um, what we can actually do is purify embryos from what we term as pre-gastrulation, so very early embryos, so an average of, of six or eight cell uh, embryos. We obviously have already looked at mixed early embryos, which basically span through here, so through the gastrulation. So here the, the embryos are transcriptionally competent. Uh, and later stage embryos, so we let these guys develop a little bit more and then simply ask what happens to the replication origins. And it was a little bit of a surprise, but you can basically see the raw data up here, the late, mixed early, and the pre-gastrulation. Now, there, there are clear changes between them, but the generally, origins are basically in the same place. And they're also fired with very similar intensity. And I can show you a little bit more quantitative view. So this is just a pairwise comparison of late, mixed early, pre-gastrulation, mixed early, and pre-gastrulation and late. And you can see that there's a very good correlation, not only in the, or the, the, the origins which overlap with each each other, but also the, the efficiency of which the origins are used, and especially for the most efficient replication origins. Okay, so uh, replication origins, at least in C. elegans, appear to be defined before the bulk of transcription, or the bulk of zygotic genome activation has actually occurred. Okay. So we, this actually ties in very well with, with data from, from published a number of years ago, which actually demonstrated that you don't actually need transcription, particularly in the early embryo, in order to replicate. You can treat early embryos with alpha amanitin, and they will continue to develop and replicate, essentially as wild type, up to the point of gastrulation. Okay, so uh, I think that ties in very nicely. Now, this potentially uh, 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 coupling of, of genes or enhancers with replication origins potentially places uh, particular spatial constraints uh, on the DNA replication program. So this is particularly apparent because obviously in embryos you need to perform DNA replication very rapidly, and, and, and in, in C. elegans this is on the order of 15 minutes. So just to highlight the, the, the issue, we can imagine a, a very hypothetical view. If you put all the, the genes or enhancers in the middle of a chromosome, potentially this doesn't matter for the genes because the, the transcripts are freely diffusible and they can do, go off and do their thing. But if you, if you actually enforce the origins are, are these places, then potentially this causes a problem for rapid genome uh, replication because the origin of the replication forks need to move through larger regions of chromosome. Uh, you can solve this situation by basically placing the active genes or the origins uh, 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 basically uh, 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 equally across the, across the chromosomes, but potentially this places a, a strong constraint on the, on the uh, uh, transcription program. So we won and, uh, and asked a simple question, so what genes are actually next to replication origins? And we did a simple gene ontology. And basically, if you look 5KB either side of replication origins, you actually find a really remarkable enrichment for genes which you would need during DNA replication. So genes involved in, uh, obviously, chromosome nucleosome biology and also regulation of chromosome segregation, cell growth, so on and so forth. So many of the genes that you actually need for DNA replication or rapid cell growth are actually right next to the replication origins. So genes near origins are associated with growth. But then what we wanted to ask is when are they actually being activated? So we can actually turn back to this uh, very nice transcription time series. And I'm just going to orient this in this direction uh, down here. So basically, single cell is up here at time point 50. So hatching is down at the bottom. And then for each of the 50 time points, we can say, relative to replication origins, when are the genes being activated? And basically, this is what we find. So this is essentially a heat map measuring the level of transcription. Obviously, dark is no transcription. Yellow is high transcription. So, and the replication origin is in the middle, and we're looking plus or minus 25 KB of the replication origin. So very early on in embryogenesis, there's essentially no, well, it's just background transcription that's measured by this assay. But when transcription initiates, it does so in very close proximity to the origins. But we actually know that the origins are being predefined right the way up here. Okay. Now, this situation seems to hold up to about 300 minutes, and then transcription gradually shifts away from the replication origins such that about 500 minutes onwards, the origins get cold, so there's very little transcription in the vicinity. 
Now, so origins seem to precede transcriptional activity. When transcription initiates, it does so in close proximity to the predefined origins. Transcription then gradually shifts away from the origins during embryogenesis. So obviously we wanted to correlate this with known developmental milestones and, and, and what, you, what basically illustrated here, this is a process of gastrulation around here. And then following the gastrulation is a recently uh, described uh, uh, developmental milestone which, known, which has been coined as the mid-development transition. And this was basically described according to transcriptomics. And what I'm showing you here is basically a, a correlation of, of transcription through embryogenesis, so that they took time, 10 time points and basically what what this this illustrates is a transcription up to time point six or the mid development transcription uh, the, the global transcription is very similar okay but transcription after this time point there's a profound change okay so the mid development transcription is, is a profound change in global transcription and that is correlates very nicely basically with this region here so when transcription profoundly changed with the embryo this is a point when transcription moves away from the replication origins so lastly we wanted to ask how is transcription correlated with DNA replication probably the most simple way we could do this is actually turn to the classic Solston experiment or a mapping experiment where he measured number of nuclei per embryo and obviously in C. elegans, this is pretty much invariant. And what you can see is, obviously, through early embryogenesis, is rapid uh, cell division. And this persists up to about 300 minutes. And basically, after that point, there is no more cell division. So this is the last wave of cell division here. And what I hope you can see is, basically, the 300-minute point is basically the point in which transcription begins to move away from the replication origins. So what you can imagine is this is basically the point at which you no longer need replication origins uh, uh, to be fired within the genome. And Potentially, this is a signal which frees the transcription program from the replication program, so then it can uh, basically explore all, you know, basically uh, uh, genes which are far away from replication origins. Okay, so as summary slides. So genes required for growth appear to be clustered near replication origins. When transcription initiates in the early embryo, it does so in close proximity to replication origins. But transcription then becomes decoupled from origins when embryonic cell division has actually ceased. Um, and we have a simple model for that. I'll skip over that and just uh, 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 thank the people who did the work. So this was basically spearheaded by a very talented postdoc, Essen Pukarimi, and also a graduate student, James Belouche. I need to thank these guys for funding, and I'll take any questions.